My name is Maithi Newmon. I'm an indigenous human rights activist. Um, I work for the Chin Human Rights Organization as a program director for the Indigenous Peoples Development Program. Um, so while working for my organization, I'm also representing my organization to the Myanmar Indigenous Peoples Network as an executive council member. I also represent uh, Asia Indigenous Youth to the Executive Council of Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, which is working in 14 countries with uh, 48 member organizations. And I'm also a focal person for the Asia region to the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. So in Myanmar, uh, as you know, in many countries in Asia, the government doesn't uh, uh, legally recognize the existence of indigenous peoples. What they say is everyone is indigenous peoples or we have no indigenous peoples at all. Uh, but uh, from indigenous peoples ourselves, um, there are many indigenous peoples groups in Myanmar, including the major ethnic uh, groups uh, like Kachin, Kareni, Shan, Chin, Mon, Rakhine, and many other indigenous uh, peoples in Myanmar. We are such a diverse uh, country uh, with, um, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of language, in terms of culture. So we have uh, so many indigenous peoples groups. Um, but why are we, um, the reason why we are working as uh, to promote the rights of indigenous peoples, because um, as a country, we are like, um, so since 1947, that all parts of the country got together to form the, what we call now the Union of Myanmar. Um, before that, we were like independent, we were, most of us were like having our own uh, peoples. We, we lived as uh, peoples. But the problem was that after coming together as a, a country, after we decided to come together as a country, and then decades later, we, what we found was that um, many indigenous peoples uh, don't get, uh, are being discriminated. And we are very much far from the the basic right of indigenous peoples, which is this right to self-determination, we are very far from that. And many of the indigenous peoples, the rights are being violated, including their social, cultural, and many other rights, even including the uh, basic livelihood. Uh, so that's why we came together as a uh, network for of uh, indigenous peoples in Myanmar so that we can work together to promote and protect the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, so actually the movement in of indigenous people's rights in Myanmar went back to uh, as as early as immediately after the uh, after we gained the independence. Uh, we Chin Human Rights Organization was founded in 1995 by the Chin uh, young students and youth activists um, in the Burma Indian Indian Burma border. Uh, those students were the ones who fled the country after 1988 student uprising uh, in Myanmar. Um, so the reason why they decided to have a human rights organization was that at that time during the military regime uh, there was really heavy militarization in many ethnic areas and indigenous people's territories and Chin state uh, was one of them. Um, so whenever we, so the, the, in order to uh, like to be a part of the democratization movement uh, that uh, many political activists were doing across the borders. Um, uh, I mean, along the uh, Burma borders. So, um, whenever we talked, about, uh, whenever they talked about uh, Chin people, uh, what they found out was that we cannot just say 
what happened, what happened uh, in that area, this area. But we needed to, uh, we needed uh, well documented human rights violation cases uh, in order to really talk about to other people who don't know Chin people and who don't know the um, the human rights situation in Burma. So they decided that they needed to uh, document the human rights situation in Chin state at the time. Um, and uh, also because there were like 90, almost 90% of the Chin people are Christians and the majority religion is Buddhism. So uh, the Chin people faced a lot of discriminations, including like torture, extrajudicial killings, and the destruction of churches, crosses, and uh, like the, and arresting the religious leaders across Chin state. So, so many violations happened. And also like there were very severe persecution of uh, these uh, Chin people across Chin state. And also like um, forced labor was a very big uh, issue for the Chin people uh, because of the heavy militarization in the region. So in order to talk all about all those issues, the youths, the uh, young leaders, they felt uh, they, they found out that it was really important to have a human rights organization in order to properly document the sufferings of the people, the human rights violations, and then to find out solutions on what we can do and also to use those documentations for international community. Uh, who are pro, uh, who are willing to support the democratization process of Myanmar. So that's how they built, uh, they founded this human rights organization. And you will, you can learn from the, all our reports that we've been documenting for the past 24 years. And we are about to celebrate our 25th anniversary in 2020. So this, and along the I, history, there are already like three people who gave, uh, who sacrificed their lives in, while they were doing human rights uh, documentation. Um, so when we talk about the rights of indigenous peoples, what we cannot, uh, what we cannot omit or leave uh, without saying is the right to land and land related resources. Um, so the one of the very basic rights of indigenous peoples that are being violated is um, it is both in, uh, legally and also in terms of administration. So for example, we have this uh, vacant fellow virgin land law uh, which uh, says that uh, the land that are not registered are all VFV land, which means that the government can decide however it wants to uh, to utilize or to give a uh, lease to those um, those land to for economic uh, improvement, uh, economic growth. So it means that the land of indigenous peoples can always be uh, confiscated any time. Uh, so all these <coughs> that are taking place and all the uh, the natural resources being exploited uh, without a fair share or without the indigenous peoples having the right to uh, to say anything about the resources in their own territory. And this is a very obvious uh, violation. But when it also it comes to cultural rights, when we talk about uh, the right to learn our own mother tongue in schools is very limited and for many indigenous groups it, there is still no facility for that and those uh, even those schools that are initiated by indigenous peoples are not formally recognized by the government system so uh, many indigenous youths they are also become like uh, inf they have like inferiority complex and uh, for example, from my generation, many indigenous youths, they are even like scared 
or afraid to talk in their mother tongue because uh, they they feel like this is low because of the uh, successive um, discrimination that has been going on for several decades. So that one term that was that has been very popular among uh, in, in, in Myanmar, the people in Myanmar is what we call Burmanization, which is called like assimilation, forced assimilation in like influence that in different indigenous groups have been facing for the several decades, starting from language, starting from literature, starting from culture, media. So uh, by all means, um, uh, indigenous peoples have been like portrayed, have been mentioned as uh, one class lower. And for example, there will be a movie, and in that movie, uh, a bad person or a criminal, usually in these movies, these criminals or bad people, they will wear like traditional attires of indigenous peoples. So, which again um, results in many youths, indigenous youths, inferior, uh, they feel inferior uh, about their culture and their costumes and the majority perceive indigenous peoples as okay bad people. So this is very much to do with how indigenous peoples have been uh, mentioned and have in, in different media, in different forms, whether in, um, how should I say, published or whether in broadcasted media. So, uh, yeah, this is how this assimilation indigenous peoples have been facing. So the majority, they, uh, it is difficult for them to really understand and accept that these indigenous peoples have differentiated rights. They have different uh, ways of living. They have different history. So when, so also in terms of history, the history that we learn in schools has nothing to do with the real history of indigenous peoples. So uh, like, so we are basically we are learning the wrong history and in which the majority of the people are portrayed as like superior to any other like people in the country. Uh, so yeah, this is how we were simply assimilated and yeah, influenced, uh, like domination happened. So that result. So after several decades, like many indigenous youths uh, faced, like uh, yeah, that sense of uh, inferiority complex. In order to overcome all those challenges, uh, the indigenous peoples are facing. The first one that we are doing is awareness raising about the rights of indigenous peoples. Um, so when we talk about the awareness raising, it doesn't mean only to the government um, it, at different levels to different stakeholders. So when we talk about stakeholders, it includes the indigenous people themselves uh, and uh, those people who are involved in administration, of course, and also um, those who are um, like involved in policy making, including the members of parliament and also uh, awareness raising for the ministers who are working for indigenous peoples. So we have this um, ethnic uh, rights protection law, uh, which was enacted in 2015. And we take that as, a, as an opportunity to insert the rights of indigenous peoples because it talks mainly about the ethnic nationalities. Um, so we like tried to facilitate, we facilitated the participation of indigenous peoples representatives in the drafting process of the bylaw for that ethnic rights protection law. So. Uh, that is awareness raising. Another one that we do is dialogue. So dialogue happens, uh, we ensure that dialogue happens at different levels. So uh, it can be like village level, it can be regional level between the ministers and uh, the indigenous peoples themselves. Uh, different types of dialogues, it can be on land, it can be 
about the forest. It can be about um, uh, like uh, learning uh, indigenous languages in uh, government schools. So uh, what we ensure is like we engage uh, ourselves into the different processes that are going on that can uh, have impact on the rights of indigenous peoples. And also we ensure that the indigenous peoples themselves who are on the ground, uh, they are engaged to um, these different processes that are going on and they can have a chance to participate. So these are the things that we make to ensure. And another thing that we are promoting is free prior and informed consent. So this free prior and informed consent is a very basic um, fundamental rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, and if this is properly practiced in different, uh, in uh, if this is properly practiced by different government agencies in different processes, projects, programs, and plannings that they are doing, uh, this can, uh, we strongly believe that they can, this can reduce many other conflicts that are going on and this can promote the rights of indigenous peoples a lot. So we are also promoting a lot for the awareness by different government agencies and also by indigenous peoples. And yeah, that is uh, about the dialogue. And another one is like policy engagement and policy influence that we are trying to have. So the one like I, I just mentioned, ethnic rights protection by law. And right now uh, the, uh, the government is uh we are having a land reform process and so which uh, under which the government is trying to come up with a new national land law so as i mentioned land is very much important for indigenous peoples fundamental and not only in terms of making of, uh, not only in terms of livelihood, but also in terms of maintaining our culture, uh, maintaining our identity, protecting our identity. Uh, so, um, so we are making sure that this law will be comprehensive and indigenous peoples will have a say in when it comes to customary land tenure. So uh, we are also trying to have this sort of policy influence on uh, ongoing policy and law reform processes. Uh, so another law that another bylaw that we are trying to influence is forest uh, forest rules uh, for the new law. So uh, these these are at different levels. Some are at very community uh, like grassroots level. Some are going on at regional level, and some at very national level, the union level. So we are also trying to engage different stakeholders in the processes. Yes, so these are the different things that we are doing to uh, yeah, promote and protect the rights of indigenous peoples. For example, I myself, uh, I'm a technical working group member of the Red, uh, Myanmar Red Program, Red Plus. Um, so when we first uh, engaged, uh, when we talk about indigenous peoples, they were right. Like, no, there is no indigenous peoples in Myanmar or Everyone is just indigenous peoples in Myanmar. But after talking about this for so many times by different people, uh, now that uh, including the government, they are more open to talk about indigenous peoples. But still, the government is very much allergic to use the term indigenous peoples. Uh, the reason why we think why refusing to use the term indigenous peoples is that it is very much related to the self-determination um, but now increasingly people are open so uh, sometimes we need to we uh, change the tone or we we change the language that we use in talking to different uh, stakeholders different uh, different people so we are talking about the same rights but we use the language that they are more familiar with and because they are very much like development oriented, many government agencies. So we need to connect to the ideas that we that they are familiar with. So we are feeling that they are increasingly open to talk more about indigenous people's rights. So uh, first of all, to to really improve the situations, uh, there needs to be an acknowledgement that um, there are indigenous peoples. 
and to accept the diverse the diversity and the differences that we have and also that the injustice have been taking place especially against the minorities um, for far too long, people look away while their fellow countrymen are suffering from systematic abuses at the hands of the successive Burmese governments. Um, we cannot keep pretending that things are all okay now because we now have a civilian government. Um, serious violations are taking place as we speak, um, like the society, especially those from the majority have uh, moral obligation to stand up to injustices and to defend the rights of those who cannot defend themselves. Um, unfortunately, discrimination against minorities on grounds of ethnic identity and uh, religious affiliations has been so deeply entrenched in social mindset um, that they have like become normalized in Burmese society. So. Um, the society as a whole has a moral obligation to denounce all injustices against minorities, but uh, the main responsibility lies with the government in ensuring equality and the protection of human rights for everyone. Uh, most importantly, we have to end the culture of impunity for all these to be possible. The scope or capacity of our documentation doesn't extend wide enough to include Rohingya situation. Um, so it is hard for me to speak about their situation in any details. Uh, but the horrors of the suffering of the Rohingya community is uh, simply unspeakable. What I can say though is that what we are hearing and witnessing with regards to the treatment of Rohingya is the worst manifestation of discriminatory policies of those who espouse um, extreme uh, nationalistic agenda. Yeah, like um, like I said, when we talk about human rights, uh, when we talk about human rights, many people here uh, in the society, they think that we are talking just for a particular group of people. So, um, and many, like I said, discriminate this discrimination has been has become very much normalized in Burmese societies so many people think that um, well human rights they are just for the Rohingyas for the Muslim minorities so things like that so people's reaction to human rights has become uh, a little bit inappropriate um, but uh, while there is no direct spillover from the Rakhine conflict, uh, Chin State has gone through a lot of problems as an indirect result. Uh, movement restrictions and heavy militarization of the entire Rakhine region have had serious consequences for local livelihood, children's education, health, and human physical security, especially in the immediate border of Rakhine State. Uh, such as Palerwa Township, which is the poorest among the nine townships in the <coughs> uh, So for perspective, Chin State is already the poorest among all regions in Myanmar. 